been in a series called Multiply, and, and, and this is still kind of a continuation of Multiply. We just changed it up a little bit, and we're calling this series Bodybuilding. Somebody say Bodybuilding. bodybuilding. Any bodybuilders in the house today? I see one back there. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm an aspiring bodybuilder. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> we called it bodybuilding, and we, you know, Pastor Brandon actually came to me and said, hey, I've got a great idea for a sermon series, and I was like, how many of you know that the Lord gives you a team, you listen to the team, and then God begins to speak and un- unveil it and unpack it, and we just started talking about it. Every morning, we'd get in there, we'd preach to each other for about 30 minutes to an hour, and we'd be all fired up, <laughs> and uh, it takes training to bodybuild, amen, amen. Right? It takes a variety of things to make a bodybuilder look how they look and, and, and build what they build. Why are you laughing, Rob? Come on, man. <laughs> it takes training. And the training, I'm going to tell you with a bodybuilder, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's about three, maybe four components solid that we can know that we need for bodybuilding. One of them is diet. Right? You can't eat donuts and be a bodybuilder. I mean, look, that's what happens. <laughs> you can't eat, you, you, gotta, you gotta have a proper diet in order to build a body correctly. You gotta uh, give it the appropriate nutrients. You even have to have rest, if, did you know that? When you're bodybuilding and you're working out, there's gotta be an equal amount, or not even equal, but it's gotta be the right amount of rest and then you've got to have exercise, and that exercise has got to contain a cardio portion of it. And I know the bodybuilders say, ugh, cardio, no. But you've got to have a cardio portion of it, an aerobic portion of it, and you've got to have a, a resistance training part of it. And as we began to look at this whole natural idea of building a body, the Lord began to unveil and unpack things about how we build a spiritual body. Because really what we're doing here today is we're equipping and building a body. You're part of the body. If you're here today and you're a born-again Christian, you're a part of the body of Christ, and you've got a function to play, and you've got to be built correctly. You know what I'm saying? You've got to be able to be built correctly. And so what the Lord has been showing us is we're going to do this series the next three to four weeks where we're going to be talking about what is it that you have to do How do you build a body? How do you spiritually eat right? How do you do spiritual cardio? How what is spiritual resistance training? And what is the end goal of what God is trying to do in us today? Now, if you're visiting here today and you're new to the church thing, you're probably going to hear a bunch of things, but listen, it's going to come together and make sense at the end of the message. So I need you to hear and understand what the Bible says. So if you can get your Bible and we can turn to 1 Timothy 4, that's going to be our scripture for this series. 1 Timothy 4, if, you, if you've been in the church a while, I'm going to read 1 Timothy 4 every Sunday for the next four Sundays. And we're going to get that thing inside of us. You're going to know that scripture. You're going to go to that scripture. You're going to remember that scripture, right? You need to remember the scripture, Because in the word of God, there is life. It is like a two-edged sword. It cuts and it separates between spirit and soul, the Bible says. So it's important to know what the Bible says. And I, I just think it's really cool that the Bible actually talks about training your body. Let's go there. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 7. I have an ESV version, just so you know. It says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Wow, that, that, that's, another, that's another message. We can go there. But listen, it says, have nothing to do with irreverent and silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. The Word of God is saying that we must train ourselves for godliness. So it's one thing to accept the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers us, right, that we did nothing for on that cross. 
He paid the price on the cross and he gave it to us. And it's one thing to say, yes, Jesus, I accept your free, your free gift, but then there's another obligation on our part that we've got to train ourselves for godliness. If you have to train yourself for something, that means that you're currently not there. Do we agree with it? If, you, if you've got to get into a training program to run a marathon, that means that right now if I asked you to run it, you can't run it. So when he's asking us to train ourselves for godliness, that must be that we are lacking some godliness characters in us. Uh-oh. Are you in the right church today? I hope you are because I personally, even as the pastor of this church, am lacking in godliness. As I speak to you even today, I am lacking in holiness and godliness that God requires. Now, if I put somebody else up here that's worse than me, I can sit up here and say I'm not lacking in accordance in, in, when, I, when I compare myself to this guy, I'm looking a little better. Come on. And we love to do that. We love to bring up brother so-and-so and say, well, at least I'm not like brother so-and-so. I got it going on. But God never said to compare yourself to other people. Sometimes we come to church and we make a decision to come to church or to not come to church based on the people that we meet in the church. And that's totally unbiblical. You're supposed to come to church to, to measure yourself against the cross of Jesus and his holiness and his godliness. Because if you measure yourself against somebody else and you're not coming because hypocrite so-and-so comes, you're a hypocrite too. And we gather here today in church. Listen, I'm, 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 listen this is a hospital. And we're all sick. We're sick. I'm sick. I got some things that I've got to walk out and work out of myself. Can I get a, is anybody in here real? I hope you didn't come here thinking, listen, if you can't be led by a guy that loves God and admits he's sick, this is not going to be the church for you. You go need to go find yourself a holy guy somewhere. Now, I strive for holiness. I'm not saying that I live my life wrong. I'm saying that I'm striving. I'm striving every day. Every day I got the same choice you've got to make, and that's to stay right with God. Every day I've got the same choices that everybody in this room has to make. Am I going to serve him or am I going to serve me? So I want to encourage you, if you're in this house, you're going to learn, you're going to equip yourself to be a multiplier, to be somebody that can talk to somebody and not get too crazy, not get, to, to not be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. And I think the world is hungry for the real thing. Y'all remember that Coke commercial a long time ago? The real thing? You know what I'm talking about? If you're old, you know what I'm talking about. If you're young, you don't know. I remember we used to dare ourselves. This is kind of off topic, but we'd dare ourselves. Anybody try to drink a Coke and chug it like that? It'd burn your throat. But in the commercial, they just like goop, goop, goop. But they're, listen, the world is hungry for the real thing. They're looking for a church and for a people that go to church that are just the real deal. So just be real. Stop being fake. Stop walking around like you got it all together. Some days it's not going good. Just say, it ain't going good today, brother. Pray for me. I feel a weight today. I feel whatever it is. I'm struggling today. I call my brother. Pray for me. I'm struggling today. We won't grow if we stay fake. If we build this outward thing that we look a certain way, listen to me, the, the, the bad part about it is when the church becomes to be fake, it's, like, it's almost like, like when the emperor has no clothes. Everybody knows, but nobody wants to say it. Everybody knows that you've got a veneer on, and that's not really you, but nobody wants to tell you. 
There should be no difference with how you operate at home and how you operate in this sanctuary and in this foyer. It should be the same thing. There should be an integrity in you that what, hey, whatever you see, you get. I'll never forget, I had a young man come and ask me as I was raising my, I still have two girls at home, I was raising my kids, and they're looking at me, and they, 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 he, the guy comes to me, he's a young kid, he goes, Pastor Robert, is there any way that I could come and just spend like a week with you in your home? I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> to some of us, it would excite us that we could share our wisdom, but some of us, it scares us to death because they're going to see the real deal. And I'm thinking to myself, as leaders in the church, I had this young man, 18, 19 years old, looking to me. Boy, did I feel the responsibility. He was looking to me to say, can I come watch you do what you do because I want to be like you. Have we equipped ourselves in a manner that we live in a way that we could say, come on, brother. Come on over to my house. Let me show you how to love your wife. Let me show you how to raise your kids. Let me show you, oh. Let me show you what happens in the private place. Because if it's not happening in the private place, it'll eventually overflow in the public place. You might be able to hold it together for six months, for five years, for ten years. But eventually, it's going to come get you. It's going to come get you. God always intended for the inward to change and to manifest in the outward. He never asks us to fix the outward and allow the inward to be unchanged. See, reformation in the church can never happen until revival happens on the inside of a man. You can't legislate morality. You can't write a procedure and a policy to say this is how we're going to operate. What has to happen, even in our country, is that the people of God, God, we've got to change on the inside. And when we change on the inside, we manifest Christ on the outside. So we... We have a responsibility for our families, for our communities, for, for everything that we do. If there's no change on the inside, there'll be no change on the outside. I stopped on verse 8. For while bodily training is of some value, you hear, see that? So it says in verse 8, 1 Timothy 4, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. There's so much in that scripture. The first point I want to make is it says, train yourself for godliness. I want you to say this. Say, train Train yourself. yourself. Who's responsible for the training? Man, if we ever get that, that you're responsible for your training. Now, God will send pastors and preachers and teachers and apostles and prophets to supplement your training, but at the end of the day, you've got to decide to train. Have you decided to train? And there's a training manual that he's given to us that outlines every single exercise that would benefit you to be godly. He's given us the training, but have you made a decision? Have you made a decision to train? Listen, if you're in here and you don't know Christ, the first thing you need to do is join the gym. You can't even start training until you have a place to train. And you won't even understand the benefit of training until you become part of who he is. When you say yes to Jesus, if you're sitting in here today and you're listening to me, and you know, I, I, was, I was listening to the song today, you know, God uses 
the foolishness of this world to confound the wise. And he'll take you. Listen, there's nothing you have done that can keep you from God. If you're sitting in this audience today and you think, man, I don't know if he'd forgive me, he will. He's here to forgive you today. You're not even here by accident. You're here to hear that message to say, hey, there's a possibility. There's, there's a possibility for me today that I could start training, but you've got to make a decision. Do you want to train? Anybody have a gym, gym membership in here? Raise your hand if you have a gym membership. Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Okay, now put your hands down. Now raise your hand if you have a bit gym membership and you go. <laughs> There's still less hands. Now raise your hand if you have a gym membership and when I said you go, it's more than once a year. <laughs> eh, some hands went down. Do you know that you can actually train and not, and, and, or think you're training and you're really not training? Some of us think that just because we belong to Christ, we're in a training program. No, you just joined the gym. You joined the gym, but you haven't gone. You go to the gym every three Sundays. Oh, Jesus. You make decisions on when you're going to train and when you're not going to train. And then you get by yourself in your mirror and you flex your spiritual muscle. <laughs> you know you do it. You flexing in the mirror. But you get around somebody that's really spiritual that never misses a workout, brother. And it's evident. <laughs> when you're by yourself, you're like, man, look at my tries. <laughs> hey, babe, check out my tries. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, baby, that's, they're awesome. You're an awesome person. <laughs> we, we do that in the, in the spirit. I think that that's why some people don't believe in healing and don't believe in laying on of hands for healing because deep down on the side, it's kind of like looking at, at 205 on the bench. You should be able to lift it, but deep down on the inside, you know you've been skipping and you know you can't lift it. So you make excuses of why you're not going to try to lift it because of the way you train for it, and you, you, you neglect going. You don't even want to go to the gym because you've been neglecting it, so you won't lay hands on the sick because you know you haven't been training for it. Your faith is not built up on the inside of you where you believe that when you lay your hand, because you know what you did last night. You know what you've been doing, so you don't want. So it doesn't make God a liar. It doesn't make the, the healing not work. It just means that you need to train. It means that you need to let go of some things and be honest with yourself and say, I can't eat hurt donuts and get somewhere. Have you ever heard of that place, hurt donut? It's a new place. They're, they're bad for you. I mean, they're good. They're good bad. You know what I mean? They put bacon on it. Y'all hungry? Hallelujah. You have the responsibility in Psalms 63 and 1. He says, oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. We have a responsibility to search for God, to thirst for God, to seek God, to go after God. He says, those that seek me will find me, right? There's a responsibility inside of you that your mentor, your mom, your dad, your coworker, your person that you're friends with, they can't give you the seeking part of it. It has to be in you to seek him. It has to come from the inside of you to want to seek God, to earnestly seek him, to meditate on his law day and night, to look for him, to want him. That's the beginning of training yourself. 
When you begin to train for, for, for a marathon, you begin to do it. You know, after the first time you run a few miles, I'm sure, I've never trained for a marathon, but I'm sure that after a while, it takes something deep down on the inside to get you up early to go run again. Anybody ever trained for a marathon? Raise your hand. Cool. Wow. It takes something really, really deep down on the inside to get you to get up and go to that gym to go train, to go do it, right? So you have to have this seeking and this thirst for that thing or it'll run out. Are you seeking God? Do you thirst for him? Like a dry, like if there was a dry place, like if you were in the desert and you needed another drink of water, do you search for him in a manner where I've got to have him or I'm going to die? Do we search for him that way? He desires that from us. He desires a people that will search for him, that want him, that are looking for him, that want to be changed by him. Jeremiah 29 and 13. It says, if you look for me in earnest, you will find me when you seek me. He says, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and bring you home again to your land. That's a promise of God in Jeremiah 29, 13. And it starts with, if you look for me in earnest, you've got to train yourself. Tell your neighbor, you've got to train yourself. Let's go to Hebrews, I think it is. Hebrews 12 and 14. I'm giving you scripture so that you can write these down. I love this. Try to live in peace with everyone and seek to live a clean and holy life. For those, oh, oh my goodness, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. There's an obligation on our part for holy living. Now listen, he gives us the ability to live holy. Because you know deep down on the inside, you have no reason to want to live holy. A a natural man does not care to live holy, but God says that without holiness, we will not see God. And in the church today, we've gotten to the place where we don't want to take responsibility for our ungodliness, our unrighteousness, and our unholiness, and that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we have a responsibility to strive for something, and He will give you the grace that you need to achieve the thing that you need. You've got to train yourself. Second Peter, I'm giving you a lot of scripture, it's all right, write it down. Right, Second Peter 1, 5 through 7. So make every effort to apply the benefits of these promises to your life. Make every effort. Then your faith will produce a life of moral excellence. When you begin to eat right and you begin to train right, your faith, because that your, your training will produce a moral excellence in your life. There is a moral excellence that can be produced in the Christian's life. You don't have to be broke down and busted and disgusted all the time. There should be a moral excellence to the people of God. It should separate the people of God from the people of the culture who are lost and don't know God. It shouldn't be where we're this big melting pot where you can't tell the church from the culture. I mean, to me, it's not, it's really logical. It's really understandable. Are you going to be perfect? No. He didn't say be perfect. He says to operate in faith and train. How many of you know when you train and you set out to run nine, you didn't make nine, you made eight? Sometimes you fail in your training. Sometimes you don't do everything you're supposed to do, but it's better than not doing nothing at all. Some of us look at living a Christian life and we say, well, I can't achieve it, so why even try? Instead of looking at it and saying, I can't achieve it, 
But with Christ in me, I can do all things. And with Christ in me, everything that's impossible is possible to me now. And you stumble and you say, but Christ is in me and I'm going to get back up. I'm going to keep going. And you can laugh at me if you want, but when we get to the end, I'm going to be found going in the right direction. You, you, have, you have to get back up. You have to keep training. I was talking to Shiro. You, you hurt your shoulder, right? You're back though, right? Full blast, 100%. He hurt his shoulder. He could have come out and said, man, I hurt my shoulder. And for a season, he goes, I'm, I'm going to get off the lifting. But before it was over, man, he ran to me and said, I'm back, man. I'm back. I'm back in there again. Because he has a passion for that, for training. Could we get that passion for training in godliness? I got hurt. Brother so-and-so said something bad about me. And my shoulders ought to suck it a little bit. Oh, you know, they didn't, they didn't greet me right at the door. Oh, I don't think I'm going back to that gym. I'm not training anymore. Listen, it's gonna, if you're training, you're, you're pressing, you're pushing. And you're going to have moments where you have to get back in the gym. Boy, that was prophetic for me. I got to get back in the gym, brother. Woo, I felt the Holy Ghost. Seriously, I've been out of the gym. I've been, I probably don't have to tell you that. You could see that. <laughs> Diet, you are what you eat. What is spiritual eating? You know, I, I came and we started like making these analogies and I was thinking to myself, people, they need, they, we need to break it down. So what is spiritual eating? This is how I'm going to break spiritual eating down for you. It's a daily devotion. So it's the word of God and it's prayer. How do you eat? You eat the word of God and you eat prayer. And I'm going to break it down for you. I'm going to break down that the word of God has to be what you eat. If you don't eat the word, then the word will not come out of you. If you don't put the word in you, then when pressure comes, word won't come out of you. If you want to know what you're eating, let some pressure come on and let's see what comes out of you and then we will know what you have been eating. I don't want to get too graphic. But. So you are what you eat. And you can't, listen, some of us, our devotional time is like having a glass of orange juice on Monday. And then we don't eat all week long. We get up early on Monday, and we have a big glass of orange juice, and we expect orange juice to sustain us with all of the nutrients and the energy that we need to live our lives Monday through Sunday. What would happen if you did that? You had nothing else to eat but a glass of orange juice on Monday, and maybe a half a glass on Wednesday, and maybe something on Thursday. In the morning, you know, 10 minutes, 5 minutes. If you did that to your body naturally with food, you would starve and you would not be able to function. Do you hear me? In the natural. But we do it in the spiritual. And we wonder why our spirit man is malnutritioned, starving, can't lift any kind of pressure, can't sustain any kind of an impact from the outside world because we've been drinking orange juice too two and a half times a week. And we think we're doing good because we read God's daily bread. And I'm not against God's daily bread. Eat it. Or pick you whatever devotional you have. Do you have a diet, a consistent, if you eat three times a day, do you go to the Word three times a day? Come on, whatever you do in the natural, he did it in the natural to teach us about the Spirit. Can we get to a place, imagine what would happen to the churches in America if we began to go back to the Word and read it, and we began to read it and begin to do it and begin to feed ourselves this thing, and all of a sudden, it's getting in our heads, but it starts making our, its way down into our heart, and the Word of God gets in our heart, and we really believe what it says in that Word, and we begin to live a life. Sometimes we feel like we're waiting and we're saying, okay, God, move. And he's saying, it's your move. 
It is your move to get serious about the things of God, to begin to read the Bible like it's life and death, like you've got to eat, like I'm hungry. See, the problem is some of us have been so long in the pig pen that all we want is corn husks. We began to get an appetite for the thing that has no nutrition. We get an appetite for the culture. We get an appetite for the music of the culture. We get an appetite for the Netflix thing. We get an appetite for everything except for the Word of God. And listen, if you keep eating junk, you'll keep creating an appetite for junk. How do you get your appetite back for the Word? How do you get it back for the word? You got to you got to decide that you're going to die if you keep eating horn, corn husks. It's got nothing. It's like eating lettuce. It doesn't do nothing. Did you know that? Regular iceberg lettuce? It's just a filler. There's nothing in there you're going to get. Maybe some water. So don't eat salads. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm playing. I'm kidding. I knew they were from the devil. Salads. <laughs> Need me a big old steak, right, Brandon? <laughs> the Word of God. How do I eat it? Listen to me. Let me give you some scriptural. I'm not going to be able to give you all the scriptures, but I'm gonna, you, can, you can search it out for me on your own when you go to read your Word, okay? You, the Word of God, you've got to hear it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to read it. Because something happens when you hear it, but something different happens when you read it. you got to study it. You can't just read over it. you got to stop and study what is that saying, right? You've got to memorize it. Psalm 119, one of the first scriptures, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You've got to put it inside you where it's inside. You've got to memorize it. And then you've got to meditate on it. Those are five different ways that you've got to eat that word. You've got to hear it. You can't hear it if you don't come here. Some of us, all we do is come here. That's the only word we get. We come, it's like eating grilled chicken every day for all three meals. All you know is grilled chicken, grilled chicken, grilled chicken, grilled chicken. Isn't that getting ugly already? You're, have you all ever eaten grilled chicken for like a long time? And you just don't want, no, you don't want another grilled chicken. <laughs> you come to church, you come to church, pretty soon you're like, man, I don't need to go to church. It's just grilled chicken. You got to put a little blackened thing on it and read it. You get a little grilled chicken, you get a little blackened chicken. You get a little chicken marsala with some sauce in there when you meditate on it. Let it simmer in the sauce. Y'all hungry? You begin to hear it, you begin to read it, you begin to study it, you begin to memorize it. Give me another chicken dish, come on. Chicken tetrazzini, Alfredo, and chicken enchiladas. Oh, my brother. Oh. Chicken enchiladas. Fried chicken, there you go. All right, back here. Eyes on me. Everybody's going, brother. <laughs> that was going away. That's how we are. We get that distra- that quick. That quick. Mm. That, that's another message. You got to hear it. You got to read it. You got to study it. You got to memorize it. And you've got to meditate on that word. If you go through the Bible, you'll, you'll see things that says that. You hear me, delight in me and meditate on my word, right, in Psalms. He, all of those, those things are in there. That word have I hid in my heart. You hide it, you memorize it, and you put it down in there. And when you need it, God gives it to you. He recalls it back for you. That's a proper diet of the word of God. That's the proper diet of the word of God. Listen, if you don't get nothing, you need to hear it, you need to read it, you need to study it, you need to memorize it, and you need to meditate on it. You need to meditate on it. If you're not doing those five things, you're not eating right. You got too much bread in your diet. 
or you got too much, you don't have enough protein in your, I don't know what it is, but you've got to be able to do all five of those things, and you can't do it on Sunday. You got to do it on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday, and you got to eat right every meal. You got to get up for breakfast. You've got to get up for lunch. Come on, some of us, we won't miss lunch. We don't miss dinner. Come on, something on the inside of you says, man, I'm hungry. It's t- is it time to eat? Come on, in the natural, in the natural, we get that thing in us where we're like, it's, it's got to be time to eat. I'm getting lightheaded. <laughs> I'm getting lightheaded, but we don't get lightheaded for the things of God because we have no appetite for it because we've been eating the stuff. You know, my wife, she, we, we try to eat right at the house. The only thing sweet you can get in our house pretty much is fruit. In fact, if my wife goes out and buys a pack of Oreos, the minute that thing comes out of the Walmart bag, I mean, if you don't get yours from the get-go, there'll be one cookie twirling on the counter, and you don't know who took them all, but they're all gone in one shot. You know what I'm talking about? Because we never... You don't have it all the time. We don't have it all the time. You have to have an appetite for the nutritional stuff. And the only way you can have that is you've got to cut off the junk. You've got to stop buying the junk. You've got to get off that telephone. Oh, Jesus serious. Man, it is bad. It is bad, bad, bad. It's a bad place. We're in a bad place with our media. Y'all might think, oh, you're a little overboard. No, I'm just telling you right now. I'm telling you right now, it's the most distracting thing in the world today. It's taking us away. It's causing depression. It's causing people to do things that they would normally not do. It's, 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 uh, Epidemic proportions of things are happening where, ki- where, where things are going round and round and they're eating Tide Pods? That's crazy. It's crazy. And little by little, the devil is, has put things in, into our things. And, and, and moms and dads, listen to me, and I'm guilty of this. We, we, we tend to give to the, man, it takes a strong back. It takes a strong backbone to resist the culture. Because even in the church, when you begin to resist the culture, you're going to have those in the church that are kind of culture And you're going to catch it be about being legalistic. And you're going to catch it about you're too much. Oh, you're this, you're that. And you've got to have a strong backbone to resist the culture. You got to be strong in the Lord. You got to eat right. You're not eating right. You're not resisting that culture. You're not, you, when it comes against you, you're going to give to it. <clears throat> it's tough. The type of eating you, you make should begin to affect the outward behavior. In the natural, what you eat changes your body form. Can I get an amen from anybody? You eat donuts, you get a donut. Right? You are what you eat. You eat pears, you look like a pear. You don't got the V shape, you got the pear shape. Come on. The man bod. The dad bod. You know I'm telling the truth. While the spirit, while in the spirit what you eat changes your outward behavior. If you want to change your outward Christian walk, you've got to begin by changing the intake of your food in the spirit. It's not about your willpower stopping to do something. Hear me, church. It's not about your willpower just stopping to do something. It really is the power of God working in you through his word, causing you to not do it anymore, causing you to not want it anymore, causing you to change your palate for what you want to eat. 
And too many times we approach this thing like self-help, and what we want to do is we want to, all right, here's what I need to do. I need to pick up all the phones, and I need to do this and do that. And I'm not saying don't pick them up if you need to pick them up, but what I am saying is until the heart of the person that holds that phone changes and said, this has become an idol in my life, and I don't want to do that to God anymore, and he puts it down, there's no real change that's going to happen. Come on, right? If, if I have an alcoholic in my house and I just keep taking the beer and breaking it and throwing it out, he still craves it every day. And every time I walk away, he's trying to get a bottle in the house until God comes and changes the inside of that person and says, I don't want a pallet for that anymore, Lord. I want a pallet for the things that you have. Then real change can begin to happen. See, and that's the, the, the awesome thing about it. See, you can't do that for somebody I can't do that. God does it. The gospel of Jesus Christ does it. When they get a revelation of who God is and what he did for them, and he begins to change them on the inside, it begins to change the palette of it. Sometimes it just starts, you, you might be sitting in this audience today, and you're in addiction, or you're in something you shouldn't be, and right now, with my words, you just know that you don't need to be doing that. And that's good because the Holy Spirit is beginning to work in you because your natural man won't tell you that you shouldn't be doing that. God's telling you you shouldn't be doing that. I got more for you. I think more of you than you. I don't identify you like that. I want more for you. Would you give me an opportunity? What do I do, Pastor Robert? Begin to eat right. I trust him that if you begin to eat right, that he's going to do what only he can do. And you're going to read something, something's going to come alive to you as you're eating. And it might not come alive to you on Sunday morning, but it's going to come alive on Monday night or on Monday morning or on Saturday. I don't know when. But I do believe and I do trust in God that God can change you if you begin to eat his word. You begin to eat it, hear it, read it, and study it, and meditate, and memorize it, and God will begin to change you. The second thing is prayer. We're the most prayer, we don't pray. I know that some of us think we pray, but we don't pray. I just know we don't pray. Our prayers are amiss. Our, we pray for the wrong reasons. God desires a deeper relationship. Jesus Prayer produces a deeper relationship with God. In, in John 15, I think it's 15, 15, he says in there that you are no longer slave, you are no longer servants, but you are now friends. Anybody have a friend in the house today? Anybody know what I'm talking about when you have a friend? See, a friend, see, a lot of us think we have friends, but we have acquaintances. You know what I'm talking about? Just don't look straight ahead. It's okay. We use that word friend kind of loosely, but really we know a lot of people. Some of us think we have 5,000 friends on Facebook or 300 or whatever you have. Some of us gauge our entire lives by the number of likes that we have, and, the, and really those things are not what friends really are, that they liked. Oh, you know, somebody likes your thing, and you're like, you get fluttered inside. Oh, my gosh. He liked my posts. <laughs> you know it's true. You say, you put this, you, you, you go, you're, on the, you're online and you get this saying, this meme that's got a cool Christian saying, and you pawn it off like you got it, and you put it up there like it's yours, <laughs> and you're looking for somebody to like it. How many guys, from, oh, because they, oh, he's so spiritual. Oh, she's so spiritual. Look at, look at what they're, oh, my goodness, look, I. Because we want to look a certain way, but really on the deep on the inside, we had to go Google it to go find something cool to say. Because we have no relationship. We have no deep intimacy with God where he would speak to us on our own. So we, pump, we, 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 we take from here, we take from here, we make it our own. We, and, and then after a while, man, you're just tired. It's tiring to be something you're not. It's just easier to be who you are. God never wanted you to carry that thing, that yoke like that, just like, you know, what I'm going to do, what do people say about me? 
But prayer, he said, I'm a friend. A friend wants a relationship. A true friend. If you have a true friend, you know that when you have a true friend, there's nothing that you can't do that you can't call and that you can't have a, a conversation. You know what I'm saying? Do you, can you, do you have a conversation with God? Do you know him in that manner? A lot of it, we don't know him because we don't pray to him. He wants us to be intimate with him. He wants something deep from us. Another thing that prayer does, it, it works humility in your life. When you don't pray, what you're saying unintentionally is, I got this, and I'm going to do it how I want to do it. And the flesh doesn't care how it lives as long as it lives. We're supposed to put to death the flesh. Every time you pray, you're putting to death your flesh. Every time you go to the Lord and you say, Father, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me my daily bread. Give me the things that I need. I forgive so-and-so, and I forgive so-and-so, and I forgive them because you first forgave me and because I, I offended you worse than they offended me, and I'm willing to forgive. And, man, you begin to pray that Lord's Prayer like that, and you break that sucker up, and you begin to pray it right. All of a sudden, God will begin to speak to you. He'll begin to give you your own memes for Facebook. You ain't got to steal them, man. You'll be like, oh, this is, from, this is from the throne. But you know what happens when you, you, know what happens when you really get it from the throne? It's yours and it's private. Woo! The best thing I've, I, I, right now I'm going through this thing where he's talking to me and it's private. There's things that I won't share with you because he shared them with me, for me specifically for me. He's given me revelations and see, th- may, allowed me to see things. Come on, do you desire to have that from him? He'll give it to you. He doesn't just do it for me. He began to speak to me and say, man, I want to have a friendship with you. You know, friends don't tell everybody everything. Can I get an amen from the, anybody that needs a friend? There are some things that when a friend shares it, you just kind of sit on it and you just say, you know, I'm a, yeah, brother, I'm going to pray for you on that. You know, it's not the topic of the next group meeting. And if, if, if we, if good friends in the natural are that way, what do you think God is like? There's things that you'll tell God that he won't share with nobody else. It's the deepest things on the inside of you that you have somebody. Listen, right now, you have somebody that's willing to hear the deepest, deepest things on the inside of you, but he's not hearing it because you won't go to him. Will he be your friend like that? Because that's eating spiritually. That's tapping into a nutrition that's supernatural. That's tapping into when you, when cancer comes on your house, when cancer comes on your house, and you've got that friendship, I'm sure, brothers and sister, that you've had some conversations that are just for you and him. And I don't need to know them. But do you have it? Do you have it? Because there's going to be a day when you're going to need it. And he's saying, would you come? Would you, would, would, would you connect with me? When you pray like that and when you read your word like that, those, both, both of those things are going to change your outward walk. Now that's the real deal. When your change comes because of what you're eating, it's the real deal. Next week, I've got an illustration. You're not going to want to miss it. I've got this illustration that's going to talk about being aesthetic or being athletic. Do you just look good or can you, you really got the stuff? You know what I mean? You're not gonna, I want you to come. I want you to bring somebody. and I want you to hear what I've got going on. As we end today, listen, it takes discipline. One of the things that is that we lack as as people, right? How many of y'all struggle with discipline? Just raise your hand, all of you. (laughs) We're all sick. It's okay. Nobody's looking. We struggle with discipline in our lives. Some of us are more disciplined in, in certain areas, and some of us are not in certain other areas. So it takes a discipline to work this thing out. 
I love this scripture because it says that godliness is of value in every way and it holds the promise for this present life and also the life to come. Listen to me, the training that you do doesn't just affect eternity. It does affect eternity, but according to this scripture, it's beneficial for the present life and for the life to come. Do you see that? So how's your present life? Are you good with where you're at? Maybe you're in here today, you've been hearing me, this, this whole Christian thing, this whole God thing is new to you. But you're hearing what I'm saying. Listen, listen, God has a plan for you. You didn't, you didn't come to God because you're good. You, you, you don't come to God because you're good. You come to God because you're submitted to him and you're saying, I'm not good and I really do need your sacrifice on that cross. Because the Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It says that we've all sinned. Every single person in here falls short and we need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on that cross to pay and make an atonement for our sin. You hear what I'm saying? And so maybe you're sitting in here and you're far from God. Maybe you've walked away from God and you're not serving him. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow him. Maybe you, this is all new to you. But the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and was raised from the dead, that you will be saved. You have to confess with your mouth, confess your sin, confess him and say, you know what, God? I receive you today in my heart and I believe it. Because first we confess it, then we believe it. That's why it's important that you confess the word so that you can believe the word. There's a confession and a believing that comes that we have, that, that's our, our deal is to confess God and to believe him and he comes and he atones our sin. So I want you to stand to your feet today. As we, we're gonna end but I, I, want, I always like to give an opportunity for people to say, hey, you know what, that's me. I'm far from God, and I really need to get right with God today. 